So good evening everyone and welcome to this um, gathering. I'm Maddie Harlem from Permaculture Magazine and I'm also uh, the editor at Permanent Publications. And over the years we've published about oh, well over a hundred plus books. I've lost count actually, it's over 30 years of publishing. And I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Alan Carter. Alan has recently published a book called The Food Forest in Your Garden. And he, um, he studied forestry and he's worked in all sorts of various different areas, but all land-based um, connected to forestry, gardening, conservation, and the management of green spaces. And during this time, he's been experimenting with cool climate um, forest gardening. So growing food forests, on small places and interestingly on an allotment, which is another dimension that interests me. So um, land that you we rent um, from our local government or local council. And he is a teacher and a writer and um, has written a blog for, for many years, which is now found at www.foodforest.garden um, and that was really what put me on to him. Uh, I was particularly interested in his experiences because he's a food forester in Scotland uh, in the Aberdeen area and so much of what's written about forest gardening to date has been um, you know, the very valuable and appreciated work of uh, Martin Crawford, but quite Southern England based or American warmer climate. And I wanted to know how does it work in Aberdeenshire? Um, because I live in Hampshire at the moment and my experience of growing a forest garden on chalk downland is completely different from Martin Crawford's um, loamy Devon soil and microclimate. So, you know, I thought I had it tough on chalk up on the downs. So what was it like in Scotland? Can we leap straight in, Alan? So what, what works for you in what we would describe as a cooler climate? Because of course, forest gardening as an idea um, and a practice has been practiced for thousands of years, but usually in subtropical and warmer climates. Um, so we've, you know, through Robert Hart, it was brought to um, the UK and is spread out a, a around the Northern Hemisphere. Um, but it's had to be adapted. So it works because it's cooler and we have much lower light levels. But specifically in Scotland, what kind of adaptations have you had to make to grow food successfully in this way? And also, would you like to define what a forest garden is as well? A forest garden to me, I've, I've seen so many different things calling themselves a forest garden that I, I'm in a way not interested in uh, defining it too tightly, I would say, especially here, it's still in a very experimental phase. And uh, there are lots of people doing it different ways. And that's, that's part of the beauty of it, really. But uh, I think the essence of it is a, a food producing system that mimics the structure of a forest, uh, but with, with edible and useful plants. Um, I very much focus on the, the edible because uh, that's where my interest lies. But some people grow more medical plants and, uh, or sort of structurally useful plants and so on as, as well. Um, so that's another difference you, you can have. In terms of what works, well, I've kind of been through Martin's book and, and quite a few others and, and road tested everything I can possibly get my hands on. Um, and what works, one answer is hundreds of species that, that work. Uh, and I can't, I can't list them all, obviously, but they're in the book. Um, in more general terms, I, I would say what works is more attention to the ground layer. Uh, we have a, a more restricted uh, 
range of trees that will, will grow up here. Um, but we have lots and lots of things that will, will grow in the ground layer. And uh, so the forest structure up here tends to be a bit different. I've, I've been down to, to Devon and Cornwall, and you have all these layers that are, are pictured in the, the kind of classic forest gardening books, and they just don't really exist in, in most Scottish forests. Um, the, the, less, the less light you have, the shorter the season you have, the, the simpler the forest structure tends to be in the few layers you, you have. So if you overdo your tree and your shrub layer, um, you, have, you have nothing in the ground layer, uh, which is, is a shame because that's where so much of the, the most interesting things and the things at work are. So it's, uh, it's very noticeable that the, the ground layer section in the book is the, the biggest one in the book. That's one of the common um, mistakes, isn't it, of planting orchards and forest gardens, that we get too excited about different tree crops. And we, you know, people tend to plant trees too closely together and don't allow for the mature canopy and, and, and the, you know, the, the, the real extent of what that tree will look like on that rootstock in 20 years time. I know I have to own up and say that despite really careful design and you know mapping the mature canopies of our garden we still planted trees a bit too close together um apparently robert hart's garden's notoriously close together absolutely yeah, yeah. it's so hard not to do that because you particularly if you're experimenting with with things because you want to try out all these things so i i kind of take an attitude of I, I stuff everything <laughs> I've said in the books and don't don't plant things too close together you'll make much more work for yourself later but yeah. it's a bit of a do as I say don't, don't do as I do yeah, um, I think we obviously we, we both have done that yeah, <laughs> yeah. but then you get, you get to thin out the things you don't like and you, you get the opportunity to try everything so it's a it's an approach that has things Going and I, I, the other thing that um, that we've we've done is that we found that you know we have natural succession in the garden. So in the very early years, our soft fruit crops were incredibly productive, and now uh, in so, uh, you know underneath larger cherry trees, for example, less so. But but that's fine because we've got different crops coming on at different times. And then because we were being so experimental, we tried things that really would be marginal, um, like growing. We thought, let's try, see if we can manage almonds in, in the South Downs. We do have freestanding fig that some years is incredibly abundant cropper. So, but we did try some of the um, prunus species and we actually pulled them out and put more sensible things in. So it is, a, you know, it is a very still, as you say, very experimental. But it interested me that your your treatment of the ground layer was where the like you say, it's the biggest part of the book. And, and you're very focused on that. And that's quite different approach from uh, a lot of other forest gardening books that tend to focus on shrubs and trees. I think if you if you're interested in food diversity, uh, then one thing things in the ground layer are just smaller, so you can fit a lot more in, so you you get a lot more diversity. And I've I've been to a number of forest gardens where it's just all fruit basically, and I can't live on just fruit. <laughs> it's I, I mean we're always told to get more fruit in our diet, but after a certain point, actually, it's quite unhealthy to be eating lots and lots of fruit. You, you yeah. actually want more vegetable. Uh, so it doesn't make sense to, to plant only trees and shrubs, uh, which are again, dominated by, by fruit. Can you tell us a little bit about some of your favorite plants? People always ask me, sort of, what should I plant? And I say, what, what you like, <laughs> um, which can be difficult because as there's so many unfamiliar crops involved 
that you don't really know what you like till you start. So again, you, you experiment with everything really and then find out what you, you like. Um, I recently wrote a post on my blog called uh, my, the, my Top 30 Forest Garden Species. It was meant to be called My Top 20 Forest Garden Species, but I just couldn't do it. Uh, you know, grew, grew arms and legs and shoots. Um, but yeah, a few of them, uh, wild garlic is uh, a real standby of mine. Um, it has quite a long season, comes up in February usually, and you've got it till about June up here, uh, especially if you have some in a really shady spot. Uh, in fact, I would always advise planting it in different areas with different light regimes, because that gives you a, a longer season. Um, <clears throat> it's very shade tolerant. It's very nice as a garlic flavor, but one of the most useful things about it is if you cook it, uh, it actually loses that garlic flavor and it becomes a nice sort of oniony leaf, sort of like cross between an onion and spinach maybe. Um, so I use that as a, as a pot herb, as a, a green in a, a lot of things over, over quite a long, long season. Um, another, Another shade tolerant one I like is dog's tooth violet, uh, the, the erythroliums. Um, they're quite unusual in that they have a, a fairly large starchy root uh, in the, the shade layer. Um, if, you, if you sort of cross cut them and fry them, they're a bit like uh, plantain chips, if you've ever had those, very nice. And the raspberries are uh, another favorite of mine. Uh, just again showing that they're not all exotic plants. Uh, raspberries are a very traditional crop, which means we've got plenty of uh, varieties of being bred over the years. Um, they're also a, a natural forest edge species, so they, they fit into the, the forest garden extremely well. And they, they grow very well there. There's also a number of uh, North American species, the black raspberries, which I, I think are particularly nice. So I've got those in the, the garden as well. Um, it's one thing about growing in different areas, uh, although those are making me very jealous talking about figs and, and whatnot. <laughs> and, but at the same time, the, the map of where raspberries grow naturally, at least in Britain, is more or less the, the border of England and Scotland. Um, and my, my partner's from Basque country in Spain, and, and they have all sorts of exotic fruits there, but uh, her family think raspberries are terribly exotic. <laughs> I take over jars of, uh, jars of raspberry jam and they go, wow, what is this? Yeah. <laughs> so we have, we've all got our kind of special exotic fruits. Another one, uh, sea beet is a, a favorite of mine, uh, another leaf. Although I actually discovered uh, a few years ago that you can eat the, uh, the flower shoot of that, the, the quite young flower shoot, mm -hmm. makes quite a substantial and, and nutritious vegetable. Um, so that's uh, an example of a, a self seeding thing in the forest garden. Uh, a lot of the things obviously are, are perennial, um, but there's a, I've got quite a few things that just self seed around the, the garden and the, the sea beet is one of them. Uh, then there's lots and lots of things in the, the carrot family. Um, so things like uh, celery, like sweet sicily, uh, some of the stronger flavored ones like Alexander's and um, Angelica. Uh, and what they, they almost all have in common is that it's the, the young leaf shoots and, and young flower shoots that you eat. Uh, they're much milder flavoured, um, they're much more tender than the, the rest of the, the plant. So they're not very productive at any one time, but they, they produce these, a lot of them produce them almost all year round. Uh, so you have a, a very long season of, of things like, like Sweet Sicily. Yeah, I've been, I've been enjoying growing um... A walking stick kale and um, and a perennial cabbage, which is actually a biannual, really. Um, but they they grow up a lovely, you know, a lovely strong stem that's quite high, and then underneath you can grow 
wild garlic and, and other perennials as well. Mm -hmm. So that you've got you've got the best of both worlds in that you've got the 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 vegetable and again the, the flowers of those vegetables are quite sweet and tasty and then you've got the under layer on the ground cover as well so yeah and the you, flower shoots again as, as the broccolis really yes is. exactly the broccoli flower shoots are yeah they're nice mm -hmm. and and then of course when they go the bees love them which is great mm -hmm. That yeah. goes so many things, doesn't it? It's, it's really the secret of a forest garden, I think, is that they, everything gets to go through its life cycle. So yes. you get as much food as you would be from an annual crop, but you're, you're getting nature in there as well because they're, they're coming for the flowers. And that lovely pest predator balance. So if you've got annual veg, because I have an area where I grow courgettes and, you know, pretty runner beans and annual veg but because there's so many more perennials flowers and vegetables and herbs there's just such a good pest predator balance that I I don't have so many of the problems that um, annual vegetable gardening can can bring. Absolutely when I when I first got my lot it was terrible with green fly and yes everything you grew covered in green fly and yeah. um, now I just don't see them because no. there's many ladybird larvae and horror fly larvae and so on around yeah. the place. And then, and then the other thing that we find is because we have bees in the garden as well, um, we we have such a long um, period of of having a, having forage for honeybees. Mm -hmm. So it starts in February. Um, with snowdrops and then it just runs all of course not edible but runs all the way through till till the flowering ivy in in November um, so there's really only January and, and December that they're they're sleeping and they they don't have forage on, on sunny days and so it means for really good good crops of, of yeah. honey that's something I don't have because it's it's a lot less. But yes. uh, the, I do notice it's always full of honeybees. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. getting the better. Some, <laughs> they're telling they're telling each other go to Alan's forest garden. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you'll you'll know. I, I originally wanted to call the book uh, "Have Your Garden and Eat It." It kind of captures for me this this dual thing about a forest garden. That, uh, in when I first got the the allotment I planted, a kind of a nice flower garden and an edible garden, and some plants for wildlife and so on. And I now find that the, the crop plants do do all these functions um, without actually any loss of yield over what they were, they were producing as, as just annual veg. So uh, I'm, I'm getting I'm getting that food production, a bit, but then I'm getting a whole other garden for free, if you like, with it. Yeah, you, I think we do get the best of both, both worlds. So over the, the years that you have been experimenting, um, what can you recommend some, I know it's always very much determined by personal taste and your climatic you know, situation and the type of soil that you're gardening on. But, but some of your, I mean, one of your real win-wins is this idea that plants go through an entire life cycle and so that we can leave them to flower and, and so we have, you know, high biodiversity and, and real pest predator balance. Do you have any other examples of, of things that you've experimented or, with that have worked very, very well and um, perhaps unexpectedly for you? I think one, one thing is maybe the, the cycling of any sort of waste from the, the garden. Um, I, I originally piled up the, the woody waste in the garden, there's prunings and uh, old raspberry canes and stuff like that. Um, in a habitat pile for hedgehogs and it was so getting so big that <laughs> the hedgehogs are going to have the whole garden to themselves <laughs> and I, I wondered what to do with all this and what I've done is um, I've basically dug out my path network 
Uh, and I've used it to make what I call half-raised beds. And these are beds raised on one side, um, and they're raised on the north side, uh, which kind of tilts them towards the south, um, and that gives you gives you more sun. Um, and it also gives you a range of niches across the bed, a range of uh, drainage conditions, which again helps you have this diversity of plants. But it also then gave me space to, to put all this woody waste. Um, and I, I then just sort of topped it off with some, some wood chip. And that's basically what I do with, with all the, the woody waste now. I either um, put it on the main paths like that, or I put it on the small paths across the beds. Um, and you walking on it helps to, to break it down a bit. Um, but it also holds all that, all that carbon. Um, <clears throat> but so from a climate point of view, that's kind of handy. Uh, but it's also, it becomes a big sponge basically uh, as, it, as it breaks down. Um, it returns nutrients to the garden. Uh, it's not dug in, so it's not committing carbon robbery. It's sort of breaking down on the surface, like in a in a forest. Um, and I just see the, the fertility of the garden as a whole increasing year on year. Uh, although I put no no um, sort of brought in manure or, or artificial fertilizers or, or anything like that into it. Um, because a forest, which is more or less what it is by now, holds on to fertility so efficiently, um, and because I'm not burning off any of this waste or, or otherwise getting rid of it, um, it just kind of builds up in the, the garden. Things get bigger and bigger. That's a brilliant idea. I mean, when I was first taught pruning, by a horticulturalist, um, and we do have quite a few apple trees in our garden. Um, there was this sort of like almost fear-based um, idea that you had to take every single pruning away and burn it because you might be spreading disease. And so we did that for some years, you know, worrying about um, uh, fruit tree diseases. And then I read that Martin Crawford just chopped, pruned and dropped and didn't worry about uh, removing prunings of any sort from, from the garden. And this was a sort of like liberation. First of all, it saved so much work because there we were cutting our wildflower meadow and then, you know, mulching the, 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 the hay cut, the trees with the hay and toiling very hard and then removing prunings and so forth. Um, and, and we began doing very much what you're talking about, just chop, drop, let it be, walk on it, break it down. And, and it's been, yeah, it's, it's, it's so much less work and, and it does work. And like you say, you're still, you've, you've still got the carbon, you're putting it back into the soil and you're creating a mulch as well to preserve water. Yeah, I mean, you do, I think, need to, to be aware of the disease material and a lot, yeah. of, uh, yeah. a lot of things will do have a cycle where they'll, they'll overwinter in the soil and then, yeah. then go back onto the, the tree. Um, so the likes of apple trees, uh, scab is a, a big problem True. in Scotland True. in general. Yeah. And I will put my apple trees in a compost bin yeah. um, and, and that will kill the, the scab. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so it won't return to the, the yeah. tree. Uh, so a, a little bit of garden hygiene is, is still necessary, but it doesn't mean you have to take things out of the system. And again, if you've got this great diversity, then you've, you've got less chance for a disease or a pest to find its way back to, to the particular plant that it was, it was looking for. Yeah. Interestingly, I have very few problems with, with slugs and snails. Again, I, I did in the early years, but mm -hmm. I actually have, have fewer and fewer, I notice. We, 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 we had legendary amounts of slug <laughs> when we started, because when we started, it was just a, a bare arable field and it had no topsoil and it was, there was just no ecology 
no, fair, no soil life, no worms, no microorganisms that we could, you know, we were aware of at all. It had been farmed industrially for many years. Um, and it took some years for the ecology to build. Great. I've been enjoying watching the, the thrush being eating snails this year and there. <laughs> and there. And there. I've seen her a few times and I keep finding the evidence around the, the place. I noticed someone in the chat said uh, good, maybe good soil um, increases the number of beetles, which will, will eat slow and snail eggs. And I, I think that's, that's probably part of it. I, I do also, snails are actually very easy to trap because, and I, I don't mean fatally trap, uh, but they really enjoy going between two vertical surfaces. So if you just lean a slate against a, a wall um, or against one of the, the walls of my half raised beds, they'll congregate there. And um, you can just go around the day and during the day and, and scoop them up. Uh, none of this going around with a torch at night. I don't see why anyone does that. And, and then I put them in my compost bins because the the uh, the job of a, a slug and snail, if you like, is, is to, to chew up rotting materials. So they're, they're doing that with the stuff I want chewed up and they're, they're leaving off the stuff I, I don't. <laughs> so they, they, even, even slugs and snails have replacement the system. Yeah, I mean, one, one of our earliest things that we did do was we put in lots and lots of little ponds uh, all over the garden from, you know, little small uh, containers that frogs bre could breed in uh, to, to larger ponds. And that seemed to bring in a certain amount of stability. And then we had uh, log piles that, uh, for us, common lizards would come into and they would... Um, I would suspect they'd eat things like slug, slug eggs um, and because we had wildflower meadow things like frogs and toads love that and also lots of compost heaps for slow worms and all of those uh, creatures seem to bring the garden slowly into balance. I think it's about sort of patience isn't it and watching the ecology of the system building year on year and nature gets to a point where it re-establishes stability and equilibrium. And it's amazing how small a pond will will bring in frogs and such yeah. like isn't it? Yeah. I, I have a tiny one but it, it gets it gets frogs in it. One, one thing, maybe time to talk about perennials and annuals. Uh, well, I, I grow both, uh, and it's largely because there's a great synergy between the two. Uh, the, the perennials are, are most productive, at least all the shoot vegetables, in the spring, um, from sort of about February to, to July, which is traditionally the hungry gap in, uh, in annual gardening. Uh, so you've, you've completely filled your <clears throat> your hungry gap for the annual vegetables, but then there's a little bit of a, a forest garden hungry gap. Um, and I, I remember visiting uh, Plants for a Future in, in Cornwall many, many years ago, and I visited in about August, and it was maybe one of the biggest collections of, of useful plants anywhere in the, the UK, and there was practically nothing to eat. Uh, and it was because perennials have this little bit of a hungry gap as well, where they, they harden off and turn to, to seed production in the, the summer. But that's when your annuals are, are most productive. Um, so I, I grow them both for this, this complementarity. And I do find you have to be careful with the, the tender annuals. Um, you don't plant them in the middle of the forest garden. Obviously, I have them segregated off a little bit. And I use the, the sunny edge of the forest garden where all the more open grown things like uh, daily, daylilies and whatnot are uh, as a kind of buffer between the shadier bits and, and that as well. And you stir fry your daylilies, <clears throat> don't you? Yes, I stir fry most things, to be honest. But yeah. <laughs> yes, that's definitely my favourite way of daylilies. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I eat them in salads as you know, just individual petals. But I haven't stir fried them, and I thought, oh, that's a 
I must remember that. That's a good tip. But it, I think one of the things about food forests, forest gardening, is is sort of overcoming habit and cultural limitations that we don't have the precedence for eating a lot of the different foods. I mean, we, it's quite easy to pick a very great variety of raw salad leaves, but but we we. I mean, I know I've grown some things in the garden and then not not eaten it just out. I mean, we grow fantastic amount of hostas. And yet I always have a little bit of reservation about eating them. And I, I think it's just habit. Um, and, so, you know, you have, I think when you're forest gardening, you have to break through that habitual what you usually eat, what you see as a a green that can be steamed or a flower that can be stir fried and sort of enter a really different way of eating and cooking. Absolutely. I mean, it's the hardest part of forest gardening, to, to be honest, is the, the number of new foods mm. and new things you've got to figure out how to cook. Uh, mm. Even new cooking methods that you've, you've got to, to learn to, to use this good the diversity of ingredients and the, the different ingredients that you're, you're getting. The gardening side of it's relatively easy. <laughs> it's the, the cooking side that's that's harder. You mentioned hostas there. I, I, I love hostas. Uh, but again, you've got to know when when to eat them and, and how to, to prepare them. It's also, I think, that going back to the slug uh, discussion, it's kind of the, the proof of the pudding, isn't it, of whether you've, you've got your your slugs and snails under control because I have hostas in the, the middle of the forest garden and uh, they they don't really get troubled by by slugs and snails. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the unusual plants you eat and how you prepare them and how you cook them? Oh, <laughs> well, we could start with hostas. How how do you do you eat them as a, as a spinach? I know Stephen Barstow loves hostas. I mostly eat them as a, a shoot vegetable. So it's the, the young leaf at the point at which it's still kind of wrapped up like a, a cigar. Yeah. It's, it's definitely the best bit. And uh, what I usually do, with, but you can cook lots of different ways. Uh, smaller ones, I'll usually put stir fry again. And stir fries are one of the, the go-to ways uh, because it it's such a great way of using a diversity of ingredients. Um, but another way that uh, I've, I've really come to, to enjoy is uh, what you might call namal style, a, a Korean way of cooking things, which is to, to steam it, um, usually just lightly, and then dress it in uh, sesame oil, soy sauce, and a bit of lemon juice. And it's very good for cooking things that have a little bit of a bitterness to them. And hosta has really quite a faint bitterness. Um, it both, hosta, hostas I would say are fairly bland um, with a slight bitterness. And that way of pairing them jazzes them up a little bit uh, and also works works with that bitterness. So that's, that's how I, I cook those. One of our absolute favorite trees is Nepalese pepper mm -hmm. uh, um, because you can keep it fairly small if you prune it um, I mean it is savage it has much fiercer thorns than any wild rose so you have to be fairly careful what you're wearing when you're harvesting but uh, we, we have well we have Szechuan and Nepalese pepper and they're both such robust trees they're Himalayan so they're they, they, I don't know how they would do with you. Do they? Do they? They, they grow here as well. Yes. They like it. Yeah, I thought they would because yeah. I've actually seen one growing in Bhutan, right up in in the mountains. So I would have thought they're very hardy trees. And we we dry the corns every year and have loads and mm. and put them in lots of lots of food such it's good flavor. amazing effect on the mouth isn't it talking about oh, yeah because it, it's like like an anesthetic be great <laughs> if you had toothache you just rub it all on because it makes your mouth go tingly and numb but you get slightly euphoric when you're pit picking them as well 
There's a lot more to trees than fruit, isn't there? I'm Absolutely. I mean, one of my mistakes is I planted too many fruit trees. And then over the years, I've brought in more diversity. Um, yeah, so as, as you said at the beginning, it's such an experimental practice. I mean, I went to Robert's garden many, many years ago, Robert Hart, um, and he was very experimental as well. And, and he was actually at that time growing pretty much English fruit trees in Shropshire with soft fruit, but mixing up the layers. Um, and I think it's been Martin Crawford, who's been one of the real agroforestry pioneers who's sort of opened my mind to um, looking at growing very different things and thinking about growing spices and not focusing on fruit but but that was what I liked about your book because it was encouraging me to again move away you know have the tree crops in the food forest but move away and look at other things and then also how do we eat them you know and how do we change these dietary habits that we've we've had um sort of in, embedded in us over a lifetime so that we actually grow the food and eat it um, because of course the more you harvest an established crop the more it likes it and grows back healthily mm -hmm. so that you don't overdo it yeah i think the the answer to to that one is uh, uh, the question of how you you change that your diet is, is slowly it doesn't doesn't happen all at once uh, it's something I, I cover in the book is, is how to acclimatize yourself to, to a new food uh, because when you you first try new food our, our bodies are, are programmed to be suspicious and uh, quite rightly of, of new things and it doesn't always taste good and actually yeah. if you just eat a small amount uh, periodically for a while sometimes that's all it takes for your your taste experience of, of that to, to completely change I, I found that with a few things so many people have to start with a flat lawn where where do you actually begin your your forest gardening journey um what would be your recommend for making inroads into that lawn and uh, planting a few things how would you start well i very much started with Basically, what I could, what I could get my hands on. <laughs> like, I, I went through through some books on it and uh, went down the garden centre, and uh, there wasn't much from the books there, but there were some things. So I sort of got those and tried them. And it is a long process of, of experimentation, and you will plant some things and then and take them out again. Um, the the question of how you convert the space to to a forest garden. I think the, the first thing to say about that is that the, the obvious way to do it, um, map map out a whole forest garden, plant everything into its, its uh, final spaces on the map, is, is a bit of a recipe for disaster. Um, because most things in a forest garden will take a while uh, to, to get up to their, their eventual size. And so for that period of, of several years usually, um, you've got a lot of ground which is either wasted uh, or it's um, you're, you're battling the weeds in that ground. Um, and the key to, to getting around that is to, to realise that um, you generally can't move trees and, and large shrubs, but you can move most of the things in the ground layer. So there's two main methods of dealing, dealing with that. Um, if you have an area that's all cultivated already, if you've got an allotment, say that's all already dug for vegetables, um, then you can plant everything into the, the final places straight away. But you do what's called catch crop in, in the spaces in between. You, you sow your, <clears throat> your lettuce and, and whatnot um, in between in the meantime. So you're, you're not wasting all that space. And so you've got a reason to be, to be cultivating all that space as well. And eventually, uh, and this is almost what happened accidentally with my, my garden, the, the forest garden, bits will, will grow up and sort of take over. 
the, the rest of the, the garden. And then there's a situation where you're planting to uncultivated ground. And what I'd recommend for the ground layer there is having a, a nursery and cultivating a, a patch uh, and sowing and planting into that and using that to plant out into the rest of the garden as you cultivate it. Because it's, it's really important to get your cultivation done well. If you, if you leave scraps of, of perennial weeds uh, in the in the ground, then you'll be fighting them forever if you if you plant perennials into them. Um, so don't try to cultivate the whole space at once. If you don't have plants to fill it all at once, which you're very unlikely to, um, cultivate a nursery uh, garden and then start cultivating the rest of the ground. And just try to, to keep Make sure your cultivation doesn't get too far ahead of your raising plants and make sure your raising plants doesn't get too far ahead of your, your cultivation. So you sort of slowly roll out the, the garden. And what I found with doing that, it was, it was also a very good way of letting plants kind of find their own place in the garden. Because if I'd sown a row of something in the, the nursery patch, um, I, I'd have quite a number of plants. And I could then plant them out in different different places, and wherever they did best, I'd take out the other ones and I'd leave them in that spot. Um, so I've given recommendations of where things will grow best in the book, but that's so dependent on climate and soil and, and so many factors that actually just trying it out is a is a better method quite quite often. Yeah, I'm. I have a question also here. Would would you to act, to start from from that place of the lawn? Would you would you mulch it first with cardboard? Would you would you um, open up the soil and how how would you actually begin with the the small nursery area in a garden? Yeah, um, you can mulch with with cardboard. Uh, Bear in mind that it needs to be on a whole growing season. So that's the whole summer. It won't do any good at all over, over winter. Um, and that you need to, to have a good layer well overlapped or things will just grow up, up through it. Um, but I think the thing to bear in mind is that the, your chance to do soil alteration is at the start. Once you've got perennials in the ground, you, you can't go in and do those those big soil interventions. So, if you've got drainage problems um, for for any sort of reason, then uh, the, the forest garden as a whole is fairly no dig. I, I tend to say I do not much dig gardening, uh, but at the start, it is often a, a good idea to actually dig it over, uh, get, get in there. Um, find out about your soil, uh, make sure you get the perennial weeds out um, and do any, any drainage improvement that you, you need to at that point. Do, do you leave nettles in, in the middle of your forest gardening or do you consign them to an edge? How do you manage stingy nettles? Um, I've had a, a nettle patch uh, and I, I keep them very much restricted to, to one area uh, because if they get ev everywhere, then it makes your, your weeding a lot harder, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah, me too. And they are quite aggressive spreaders. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but they're also a, a very useful uh, vegetable and, and all round plant. So, uh, yeah. Even though I can forage them quite easily, I have a patch in the, the garden because what you can do then is cut them down to get fresh growth when when all the, the wild ones have, have sort of hardened off. And you, you shouldn't eat nettles once they start flowering because they have uh, cytoliths in the, the leaves, obviously, and that uh, can cause uh, problems. Um, but since then, I've discovered fen nettle. 
um, which is basically nettle with all the advantages and none of the disadvantages of, of stinging nettles. Um, it's it's a non-stinging stinging nettle, basically, uh, and uh, as well as not stinging you, uh, it's more upright uh, and it's less spready than your your sort of standard nettle. So my my wild nettles have their come on a sugarly peg. I'm afraid I'm going to get rid of them uh, all the time, and uh, I'll I'll probably just just rely on the fen nettles. And and wh where did you get your fen nettle from? I got them as seed, and I think they came from a guy in Poland through eBay. Oh, okay. Uh, it might have been from Stephen Barstow. I'm not right. Sure. I'm right. Sure there. Well, one thing I really enjoy about publishing is is having different authors and always different approaches and perspectives and what I really loved about your book was this very dynamic relationship you you're not just a forest gardener or a horticulturist you're someone who really delights in in harvesting and eating and sharing your recipes and and what you do with plants and for me I think that's really helpful because it in as I said before it encourages us to be much more experimental with with what we grow and what we eat yeah really and to, to me what's the point of doing it if you're not <laughs> if you're not interested in the food and I'm, I'm in it for the food yeah <laughs> Yeah, well, we can be in it for the food, but sometimes get a little bit um, conventional about what to do with it or a bit bored and in a rut. So it's, it's always good to have other people's perspectives. So it, over the time that you've been experimenting, which is a fair few years, I don't know, how long have you had your, your food forest garden? I've had the allotment since 2000s. Right. Uh, well, I, I was experimenting in other spaces before yes. that. Yeah. And I, I guess also one of the roots of it for me is I've always been a keen forager. And in a way, a forest garden is just a concentrated foraging resource. There's a whole lot of plants you can forage planted in the, the same area. It's almost going back to how you have to assume agriculture started, uh, but with a, a different mix of, of plants. Um, so I've always been experimenting with different foods in that way and so on as, as well. So besides Stephen and Martin Crawford, have you ha have you any other recommends or sources that have inspired you to push the envelope and experiment with new stuff? I think rather than the Plants for Future is, is worth naming there. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's an amazing site they have in Cornwall, but I think even more than that, the, the database that they, they put together is just uh, invaluable for anyone doing, doing this sort of stuff. Mm. Uh, beyond that, I think it's this, this network that you, you mentioned, and, and there are so many sort of great, well, I'm afraid Facebook has kind of taken over from the, the bulletin boards that it used to be, so now it's, it's great. Facebook groups they're discussing and you can have individual plants having their own Facebook group <laughs> of enthusiasts um, who, are, who are experimenting with cooking, who are breeding, who are sharing seeds and, and so on. And I, I learned so much um, from that network and I've, I, I, got so many tips and, and pictures for the book and, and so on that uh, that's that's one thing I'd really acknowledge for the, the book the, the the help of of all those people putting into to all those open source networks if you like thank you very much Alan I mean it's been great to chat I think we could go another hour Alan's book title is a food forest in your garden and you can buy it on his website, which is um, foodforest.garden, uh, easy to find. Or you could hop along to Permaculture Market, which is shop.permaculture.co.uk, where you'll also find uh, Stephen Harstow book.
early book called The Plants for a Future by Ken Fern that we did with him many, many years ago. And a couple of new titles from Martin Crawford about shrubs and trees and many other things. 